Welcome to Ogilvy On, a monthly thought leadership content series focused on the topics and trends that matter most to brands, marketers, and business leaders looking to make an impact. If you've missed any of the Ogilvy On sessions, all previous sessions are posted in full to the Ogilvy.com website. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Now on with the show. Nice to meet everyone. I am Kelly Hanratty and I lead the employee experience practice here at Ogilvy. Um, this topic today is near and dear to me um, because helping clients activate a transformation is some of the most rewarding work that we do. But sadly, the most common use case for a client bringing us in to help them is when they've fallen into their own trough of disillusionment. <laughs> a transformation has launched within their organization, but they're not seeing the results that were promised to them. And organizational skepticism is rising, financial panic is setting in. And so when we get brought in, we start with our forensics work uh, to determine how we might turn things around. And what we commonly hear is, but I had a town hall. Why didn't my town hall work? And we commonly see the disconnection between the transformation vision and the work that employees do every single day. So as we've come to learn, a transformation isn't just a business strategy or a new whiz-bang technology, and I might have dated myself by saying whiz-bang, uh, <laughs> transformation truly is the new work, the new results done by your people every day. And we are so excited um, today to be able to tell, talk to you more about that. All right, I think we're back on. Excellent work team. Okay, so um, some of you on this call may be asking, are we really still talking about digital transformation? And the answer is yes, yes we are. But here's why. <laughs> Uh, research shows that most organizations have an active digital initiative in progress. And we all saw this play out live um, during the pandemic when companies were scrambling to find new ways to do business in order to survive. And my colleague Jury uh, often says, if you're in business before the pandemic and you're still in business after the pandemic, then congratulations. <laughs> And at some level of transformation probably helped uh, to make that happen for you. And thankfully, as we see in that bottom right corner, that having a digital mindset or a digital culture is yielding results. Companies with digital first strategies are significantly more likely to achieve their business goals. But as we see on this next slide, why is it so tough? And what, and what is still proving to be a challenge for organizations is a successful digital transformation. Researchers and analysts have been tracking the success rate that you see there um, in the corner for a long time of that hovering around 30%. And unfortunately, that number hasn't fluctuated too much over the years. And if you're reading the stats on the right, they point to some to something that we see in organizations all the time. Leaders, managers, and employees have people-related challenges. And I'm sure we can all relate to that as well. Um, and the remedy for that is not to leave out the humans, because in fact, they have proven to be quite successful in getting work done. But the key is to design your activation to engage all three of those layers, the leaders, the managers and employees. And that is not the last time you'll hear that. Before we jump in and discuss how to improve the ROI on transformations, I just want to say that these are the kinds of problems we help brands work through every day. Some transformations are small, but need to make a big impact. And some are huge and mission critical. But regardless of the size, Ogilvy Experience is ready to help you. And that help may start with a bit more food for thought by exploring some additional points of view from Ogilvy experience across the globe. So if we could, let's start by taking out our phones. This QR code that you see on the screen will take you to a digital version of our Ogilvy experience magazine of thought leadership. Ironically, we also have a printed version too. 
So zap the screen now to explore the latest thinking in the future readiness of brands, data maturity, driving meaningful virtual connections, ways to make personalization efforts even more effective, and of course, thoughts on how to put people at the center of digital transformation, the topic that we're discussing today. Okay, did everyone get a chance to zap? We're, we're moving on with the show. So today, what we're going to discuss are a few things that you see on the screen here. The first is the difference between being digitally enabled and being data driven and the impact that that difference can actually make on your business. The second thing we'll go into is how we might assess the role people are currently playing in your transformation. And then Al will take you through a framework for how to break your digital transformation, which can feel very big and very overwhelming sometimes, down to tangible and manageable actions. I think it's really a, a beautifully simple um, framework that we'll take you through. And then Jerry will close with proven ways to activate a transformation across your organization. We can go on to the next slide, please. So digital transformations are really inspired by new possibilities. Uh, next slide, please. Digital transformations are inspired by new possibilities, fear of competitive encroachment, or clearing operational hurdles for your people and for your organization, or a combination uh, uh, therein. But at the core, these are all motivated by human-centered needs or ambitions. If done right, the technology part of a digital transformation is designed to solve human-centered problems. And how to actually make that happen within your technology is a good session for another day and something that Al could help you with in the future. Um, but there is still a role for people beyond the tech. So employees need to feel confident and empowered to deliver on the new expectations of the organization and their own manager who will be expecting new insights and new results from that transformation. So what does that potential actually look like? So on this next slide, we're showing, we're painting the picture for you of what's possible when you've fully activated a digital transformation. So you've made that movement from purely being digitally enabled to truly being a data-driven organization. So it can be the difference between sending customized communications and truly creating personalized experiences. It's asking employees to use new data in their workflows versus empowering them to experiment and to test to see what's possible. It can also be moving from a sole focused on results, which is always good, to being focused on learning so that you drive even greater results. And being digitally enabled is applying data versus designing with data and thinking about how data integrates into uh, the work and the propositions that you have for your customers and their experiences. And this could be the difference between working with data and truly creating a culture that values and thrives on data. So quick, quick note here. Um, this is what I think is interesting. It, it's not an either or. It's not digitally enabled or, or data driven. I think it's foundational. You almost want to be digital, digitally enabled first. You want your organization to understand where the data is, uh, where your digital capabilities are, be comfortable with who you are as a data organization, and then use that confidence to step into personalization, one on one, uh, A B tests, and those types of things. Testing and learning. I think what's interesting here is. Sometimes as leaders, we can charge our individual contributors with results. Give me results, give me results. But where's the conversation around, give me tests? What did we find out? What did we learn from data? Uh, I think we talked before about data costing us money to store. It's, it, it costs resources to comply for that data to be adhered to the security standards around it. Let's be actively using it. So why not actively learn from it as well? All of these tenants, uh, I think are important, but they're on a continuum. One is foundational, uh, the next is iterative. So I just wanted to add that quick note. Thank you, Al, that's great. 
And Jari is going to walk us through how you might start assessing your own organization to see where you are in realizing these results. So what is the vision? What are the outcomes we're driving toward? And if that's the future, what do we call the outcomes we're enabling today? How do we get real about where we are now? And how does all of this relate to our ability to fulfill our purpose as a brand, as a business unit, as a team, and even as an individual? It sounds really deep, but if we don't get deep about how technology actually matters to the people, adds up to meaningful abilities and outcomes, <clears throat> it's just a very expensive project and it's not much of a transformation. Reshaping your culture is about being ready to run with new digital superpowers. And it's also about taking some basic inventory. Do we value learning just like Al was talking about? Do we teach the ability to take risks? Because digital transformation is trying new things with data. Are our people empowered to activate the data? Do they know how to identify, mine, synthesize, and apply that data to their day-to-day -day work? There's a lot to take stock of, but we've got a few questions you can start with to begin to identify gaps in the ability to connect your technology to your people and purpose. So do our teams understand why we need the ability to drive new outcomes. We had a client that we worked with not too long ago, and they had a really uh, expensive digital transformation that they were in the midst of. They were about three years in and a billion dollars gone. And uh, it was time to reboot but um, leaders had um, kind of had the foregone conclusion that everyone understood why um, this digital transformation was so important. And even as they were rebooting, they were struggling to get people um, to, getting, to gain traction and to really start to gel. They'd had um, turnover on the team. Uh, they obviously had put some new leadership in place. And then the new folks on the team um, weren't really sure why everyone seemed so shell-shocked. <laughs> and so when we arrived on the scene, um, we interviewed employees and managers and leaders, and we started to understand that the current employees, the ones who had been around, they were very dedicated to one another because they'd been in the trenches, but um, they had started to lose sight of what, why this all still mattered. Um, and uh, leaders had really, what we realized, kind of stopped playing that drumbeat of what the purpose was because as things had shifted and they lost, um, they lost sight of what the big uh, innovation they were trying to drive and realized they needed to just um, go for the table stakes of making sure that they were modernizing their core systems, they kind of lost their, their zeal for the project and they, they hadn't sort of um, learned from what, what their mistakes were and repositioned what the new purpose of that digital transformation was. And so um, we helped them to really craft a narrative that helped bring, bring purpose back to the conversation and really contextualize um, why it was so important to get this right and what their new commitments were gonna to be to make sure that they learned from the past mistakes, that it wasn't gonna be about sweeping those mistakes under the rug. It was gonna be about looking them right in the eyes and starting to build in feedback loops so that they would know sooner and act sooner on when things weren't, weren't going right. So being able to, to constantly contextualize and not take for granted, that your people understand why we need this ability to drive these new outcomes so that when it gets um, kind of hard in the midst of digital transformation, everyone still knows what the effort is all pointed toward. Another question to think about is, do they know, 
Do our people believe these new business outcomes are actually possible? And I think Al's got a really great example um, of, of asking this question. Yeah, too many examples, actually. <laughs> um, I think there's two, two answers, right? One is at the corporate level. Um, let, let's say you're working at a corporation and uh, not a franchise. Um, you need leaders that are really good at storytelling, certainly influence, um, um, certainly impact as well in terms of leadership. But you need good storytellers, but you also need them to be able to listen to their organization. I think we talked about before, if your contributors feel like you're listening, they'll trust the things that you're saying. If you don't sound anything like what they've talked about in terms of pain points, and we'll get into some of those identifiable pain points later, then it's less believable that we'll actually get through this transformation. Sometimes you've had failures in the past, and I think everybody, you know, we're all adults, we kind of understand that there's going to be challenges, but we like leadership that's listening. It makes it more believable once you beat the drum for these messages internally. I like restaurants for the second type, uh, the second part of that answer. What we found with the restaurants that we've worked with is that there is some separation between brand standards and those types of things um, and standard operating procedures that happen boots on the ground. So we like people managers that are really good at translating that brand message to frontline workers and then translating and lobbying for the right software and advisory you know, items back up to corporate. People managers really start to matter once you get into managing uh, frontline workers. I think it's kind of two answers. At the corporate level, it's one set of answers in terms of how, how we can get you to believe and rally around something uh, or initiative. I think um, in the other examples where there is a workforce that is disparate in some way, physically or something like that, um, I think that's when it comes down to people managers being much more effective at, um, at translating. Great. And this next question um, is definitely a rubber meets the road kind of question to ask ourselves. Do they know how to spend their days differently, equipped with new insights from the data? Do they know after you've trained them as users on this new software, this new, this new service um, uh, that's going to give them data, they know how to interface with it, they know all the views, but do they know how they're going to infuse the insights they can get from that tool into their daily collaborations, into their weekly and monthly planning, into how they envision what's possible and how they're going to chart a path to work toward those outcomes? And uh, I know Kelly's got a great example from some of our work. Yeah, absolutely. This question makes me think of a client of ours who jumped into software as a service, those SaaS applications with both feet. They engaged with tool after platform to bring new data and insights to their marketing work, but nothing changed. And they had the town hall that I spoke of earlier and nothing changed. And this company was providing tools, data, and resources to some of the best marketers out there and still nothing. So for even those minds, those who are top of their craft, that wasn't enough in terms of those activation efforts to really move into um, how to really maximize the data and the applications that were in front of them. So we were engaged for a series of learning experiences and enablement to take these markers through the integration of tools and data into their work. Step by step, workflow by workflow, we first talked about the new data conceptually and in the context of what they know, which is the work that they do every single day. And we aligned the curriculum to the objectives that they had set for themselves about trying to be more customer centric and more outcomes focused. Then we could tackle which, what I think is the easier part, uh, which is teaching them how to actually use the tools. So building that ability to, to use the platforms um, that are in front of them. But the moral of the story is really that you can't leave those things to chance. It takes time. It takes intention and commitment to truly move people forward. Great. Um, 
Al's going to talk about how to start charting the way through digital transformation and how you're going to really contextualize exactly what Kelly's been talking about is how um, people will actually meaningfully arrive at new capabilities, but you got to get a little granular first. Yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the material you'll, you'll see about a digital transformation it feels abstract or op operational excellence, uh, revenue at the core, deciding on your why, upskilling. Uh, but there's no framework to get through a digital transformation. Um, so we try to do the work of actually arranging what that framework might be. So let's talk a little bit about what the tenets of the framework that we've put together called Digital Transformation Architecture. And then we'll walk through some, maybe one tool uh, that we use that's inside of that framework. So tenets of DXA. So I think plotting the full human experience is first and foremost. I think we have to understand what humans have to deal with. This is customers, this is employees, this is stakeholders. I mean, every single human. Because there's not many back-end processes that are happening that don't have anything to do with what a human did, right? It's either feeding some human action or feeding off some human action in some way. Um, so what we want to do is, is, is plot those full, uh, that full continuum of stories. So one of the things we use is a service blueprint, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but we find that to be one of the most critical tools to merge um, the user experience team with the emotions that, that happen to a customer along the way. The product management team and the workshops that they're doing with internal side-by-sides and, and managing KPIs with a customer. And then also the, uh, the internal teams with technology. So we're gonna blend all of those together in one artifact and that's called a service blueprint. We use other tools as well, but that's, that's what we're gonna look at today. The next step is inventorying the possibilities. This is where we actually look at some of the pain points that were revealed in that uh, first set of workshops and actually plot out what could be. Here's a little bit of the what, but we're gonna actually build a configuration of a DNA around our transformation that comes from those service blueprints and those early workshops. Not just gonna be about technology, not just gonna be about responding to chat GBT or something like that. It's literally going to be built around the plotting the pain points. And I can't wait to show you what that looks like in action. And then finally, building an internal culture of change. And I think the simplest way to put this um, is we want to build a culture that is confident in the ecosystem that we've that we've created and they want the change. They're interested in the change, not want the change, like who wants change, right? But they're interested in the change. They actually invite and encourage the conversation around change. They're not so stagnant and uh, concerned about their technology or processes or leadership that when they see a change uh, around the corner that they get upset and they think that it can't help them in their day-to-day -day life and that it can't improve who they are as an individual contributor. We want, to slight to, we want to slightly change that culture. And once you do that, I think you're off to the races. But let's look at uh, some examples of how to get there. So let's define digital first. Um, it's this ominous term that everybody kind of talks about, but let's break it into something that I think that we can all objectively see. And I can't wait to hear the debate about this because we've done it uh, several times internally, but we all kind of like boil down to like, you know, I, got, I guess this is kind of digital. So first question is how accessible is this action across um, an organization. So when you're judging is whether or not something is digital, and I don't mean a system, I mean like an action. So customer places order, order changes status, organization ships order, right? Those are just, those are verb noun relationships at their very simplest form. How accessible is that action across the organization? Now, if it's not that accessible, then it's probably not digital. It's probably sitting in some data warehouse somewhere or some WMS somewhere and no one has access to it until some job kicks off. So let's just, let's park that for a second. Then across the Y axis, we're gonna ask the question around process automation. Is it repeatable? Is it predictable? Is it something that we can build some kind of automation around? Now, if it's a paper, a physical piece of paper, then there's obviously challenges to scale. Once that starts to become digital, 
or digital, digitally enabled, or dare I say, data driven. That's when we start to move out a little bit. So next slide. So in its simplest form, things that are less available to the organization and less predictable, less repeatable, they're typically less data or less digital. And things that are the opposite are typically more digital. So our natural progression during these exercises are to move each step up and to the right as much as possible. Now, up and to the right sounds all optimistic, but let's, let's break that down too. So next slide. So we actually chart out on what we call a capabilities matrix and say, we're gonna ask the customer all these questions about their organization, break their organization into their smallest minute pieces, the smallest manageable pieces that Kelly talked about earlier. Everything is gonna kind of cluster to the lower left if it's a less digital organization. It's a black box, no one has access to this system. It's some person in some dark room that gets some order and then when they feel like it, they move it to something, you know, some next step. That's, that's gonna be lower left, manual black box. Next slide. During our conversations with the customer though, we're gonna look at each one of those steps and trust that each one of them is critical to the organization. Otherwise, why are we talking about it, right? And we're gonna say, what's your appetite to move this from being black box? Not all the way to the upper right, but just one step over. How do we get at least this item digitized? How do we get it to be data specific now? How do we get it to be something that the rest of the organization can see? So that moves it up a little bit. So not always can you move two blocks, right? We found that uh, everyone is not a zealot around digital transformation. Some groups require a KYC process. They require a conversation. They require human intervention so it's less predictable. And that's the thing we need humans for. So when things are not predictable and they do require a conversation with a customer or something like that those are things we actually want to pump the brakes and make sure that a customer um actually or make sure that an employee actually has a, a bite of that apple prior to moving it forward and that's fine we want to capitalize on opportunities where we can automate and then make the more opportunities for that human intervention and make them more valuable so this is kind of the matrix that we use to move each one of those steps and you'll see I know this kind of looks convoluted, but it's so funny. At the end of these exercises, everyone is usually like, oh, we know these 19 pieces can't be moved right now, but these other 40 are very critical to the organization, and we know just the, the, the software to move us from this to this. And we actually make those recommendations as well. We, we perform several audits. We look at technology partners. We look at partner evaluations and those types of things against each one of these, by the way. And this is our 8 to 12 week. Um, DXA process that we have, and we call it a strategy engagement, but we're, we're evolving to DXA. We're actually going to give you a recommendation on a piece of software or a partner to use to advance each one of these pieces. And then we'll actually handle the work or just handle the recommendation, but um, that usually is a separate conversation. But this is our capabilities matrix and moving these each of these advents to being more and more digital. Next slide. So how do you get to those little small chunks? How do you get to where you actually understand the business at a very small level? This is the service blueprint. <clears throat> and again, we like this exercise because it combines design, it combines product, it combines technology. And for you product management zealots out there that say there's not enough rows here, I know we couldn't put them all on this list and you know we couldn't put them on. There's like nine different rows for a service blueprint. But these one, these are the ones that we think are the most critical in explaining what they are. So customers either doing one of these six major epics with you at any given time, they're learning about your brains, like walking into your store or something like that, uh, or uh, landing on your website, or engaging in your app for the first time, or they see a kiosk at, at uh, amusement park. This is them learning. There's also the idea of buying, right? This is them making the decision. They've, they're gonna perform the acquisition. They're actually gonna give you, um, you know, some information about their, their financials. This is the buy. Get is where you deliver the service to them using is them using it. Paying is them paying again, like there's a recurring charge or something like that. 
And then obviously the most inevitable piece here is support. Things are going to go wrong. Uh, we want to learn as much as we can about our customers' lives, but we want that support silo to be very valuable as well. And we just learned the customer journey. The next step, if we go to the next slide, is to pair the customer's journey with what an employee has to do either before or after they perform that action in order to support it. And then we pair that with what technology is required for the employee to perform that action before or after. And sometimes it's a piece of technology, a website or something like that that just supports the customer action. A website is not necessarily going to engage with an employee action, but the CMS will. So we actually do do handle those correlations inside of the service blueprint. But you're starting to see how things are related. Each of these actions, less digital, more digital, right? We, we plot those on the capability metrics. And then each one of these actions, next slide, and this is, the, this is the, my favorite part. Now you can actually see the pain points. Here's why this is so valuable. If we notice more pain points on the employee actions piece, and what did, what did we see in Kelly? Injury stats earlier, 70% of digital transformations are going to fail, doomed to fail if the employee piece is not figured out, employee adoption just isn't there. And we see very plainly that there are pain points around those actions. Let's design a digital transformation that draws a line around those pain points and make those the core DNA. But then we've also got support systems that, I mean, we're sorry to say, um, you have to be decommissioned sometimes. Sometimes there's governance standards, sometimes there's adherence standards uh, where we actually have to decommission a tool or, or uh, no longer being supported or something like that. We want to make those a part of the digital transformation as well, but they're not necessarily, they, they shouldn't be the core. It should be about your people, solving problems for people. And then obviously, once you get those core pieces right, we want to absolutely solve problems for customers because that's going to translate into better brand value and revenue as well. But the goal here with the service blueprint and probably nine other tools that we use, this is just the one that they allowed me time to talk about here. Um, we wanna draw a DNA around these core items and around those pain points. And then here's a final little tip. Once executives have that lined out, now you have ammunition and jury, you know, reminded me of this, now you've actually got ammunition to send into the organization. You can send that artifact and say, here's what we identified as pain points. We listen to you, we hear you. So now if you need to lobby for more funding, or lobby to make sure that there's still advocacy for your transformation, you've got an artifact to do that. So we think the framework kind of helps with that internal messaging at all uh, as well. So that's us kind of walking through one of the core pieces. Jury, I think you're gonna take us through the next few parts. Yes, thanks, Al. So, we're going to talk about activating purpose, but this is also a nod to activating intentionally, infusing transformative behaviors into your culture. It does take a plan. It won't accidentally happen on its own. And the thing is, leaders are quite used to being held accountable for results. It can feel scary though, to talk to them about being accountable for the culture. But results of a digital transformation don't happen without the engagement of employees at large. And as we've noted repeatedly, the new behaviors we're asking for from employees are culturally driven and enabled and reinforced. But employees at large can't be accountable for new behaviors that you want them to have before leaders are accountable for setting new expectations and removing barriers for managers who can then do the same for employees. Success really comes from connecting people's efforts to the organization's highest purpose, strong visions, are the ones that get excitement going about what, yes, what's possible on the horizon, but it also a strong vision <clears throat> is one that gets real about what's just ahead. The challenges that await us before we get to, to where we're ultimately going. And then you need the enablement and the upskilling in abilities 
to, to be in place in order to drive that vision team by team, which is why managers are so key. Because here's the other thing about culture. When we feel overwhelmed by the job of transforming culture, it helps to remember that there's no such thing as a monolithic single culture at any company. What seems like one culture is really all the teams and clusters of affinities that add meaning to the work and interpret business expectations for one another. And there is no greater ally and partner in driving a transformative culture than a manager who's been invited, expected, and enabled to do exactly that. So I think we can take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much in there uh, to, to unpack. And we had, we had a comment, um, which was about a, a view that, that people building front-end applications don't think much about the quality of the data that their systems output. Um, kind of tangential, but still kind of an, an important one because it talks about the degree of integration within transformation efforts. How much, how much do you see that? How do we mitigate it? Well, I think Is that's that a good one for you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, we have pretty regular fist fights about this. So what typically happens is I want my front end development team to, to trust the source of the data and, and to trust that we've collected and clean and, and accurate data and that our sources of truth are solid enough that what they're calling back in API is what it needs to be to display to customers. But there's also um, some misgivings. Uh, occasionally, you'll pull back dead data. Some, occasionally, you'll pull back incompletes. And sometimes, you'll pull data um, that is supposed to help you arrange navigation that's not necessarily populated. Um, so there are sometimes some, some mix-ups there. But I listed here some back and for front end architectural approaches, GraphQL, that could actually help in those conversations that empower the back-end teams a little bit more. It moves a little bit of that accountability to that front-end team, but that's fine. We've got senior um, front-end developers that are thinking about those types of things. So I think that's fair to pull some of that accountability forward. But then there's microservices that arrange data um, to make available more um, smaller data um, to make those calls. So maybe you have a less chatty app, but now you can attack two or three data points and we're running as opposed to pulling back an entire API call schema that you're not going to use and that type of thing. Sorry, that's getting too deep for this call, but I feel like that that's the answer for this question. But but please let's let's keep going. Yeah, okay. A lot a lot of times we hear from clients that let's say intellectually they understand the components of a successful digital transformation, right? They've done they've done the due diligence, they know where they want to play. They think they know how to win, but then you get the question is, okay, but what do I actually do and how do I get started? So for people entering into uncharted waters, what are some of the first things you need to work out before you enter into a, a transformational scenario, let's call it? And Al, do you wanna take that one? I, I, I know you've got lots of thoughts on this one. I want to take them all, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so so I think one of the first things you want to find out is what your pain points are and not for some altruistic reason, but we want to prioritize them and give a dollar value, a business value to every one of those pain points. If every pain point that you have has some kind of mission critical business value, ROI is high, but we do what's called a heat map. And it's part of the TM forum uh, framework for ETOM. Um, once we find on a heat map that something is high impact, but low level of effort, we're going to do that. Like, but, but we can't get to that until we've done that priorities conversation. So we want to find out what the kind of the problem space is first and take inventory there first. Jury, you spoke about about the transformation narrative. How do you craft that? Like, who does it? Who's responsible for that narrative? 
And who needs to see it? Who needs to buy into it? Are there a bunch of them or is there just one? What is the transformation narrative? How does it work? Oh, I love this. Um, so kind of like with the example that that I was the, that I was giving about the <laughs> semi-failed transformation that we sort of they had to pull up and reboot. Um, that narrative, of course, um, we think of it as starting with leadership in the sense that it's this it's this real moment of of everyone of, of forcing alignment. Um, there's a lot of things that can be taken for granted even at the the leadership level. You kind of like go into your your daily and weekly grinds with your separate departments or teams, and you can you can yourselves lose sight of what what this purpose is, what we're still driving. So so for sure, working with leadership first um, in terms of the narrative, but it's really important that we have already had some um, uh, interviews and even focus groups, depending on the size of your organization um, with the employees and the management levels so that we are bringing into that session voice of the employee. And that is so crucial because even as Al and Kelly both have, have spoken to, if you're only sort of framing things at the highest at the highest order and you you don't have language for how things really affect the people in this work it can just feel glossy and it can cannot actually connect with the realities of who of who you're actually trying to motivate so um so you know there's there's usually a a, a workshop or two but what we come in with um to that workshop is a voice of the employee um, and a good inventory of the of the different um, uh, challenges and sort of the 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 kind of wind in your sails um, uh, that you have going for you in, in the in the employee set. And this narrative is it a one and done thing, or does it does it evolve over time as the transformation progresses? So hopefully, it evolves over time. Um, you need a strong one at a at a launch moment. And again, as we've said, <laughs> we know that 90% of organizations are in the midst of a transformation. And that's probably always going to be true. So we know that uh, a start and end doesn't feel necessarily like a reality, um, but there has to be, a, you, you have to have already taken stock and said, okay, how are we beginning? What's our story to begin this phase or this reboot or what have you? But then to the same point of the framework that I worked through, you have to ask yourself, uh, how are we keeping the enablement fresh? How are we um, clear about the abilities that we're driving, the new abilities that we're asking people to acquire? Um, and those things hopefully will change over time because you know, e even in Al's grid, um, things are always going to be on the move. So as you achieve one, you know, one set of capabilities, now it's time to tackle the next and the narrative to get you there because your current reality is it, it actually sets you in a different position than you were before. Hopefully you are revisiting purpose all the time and recontextualizing it and enabling managers to do the same at the team level. Awesome. Question of accountability. We um, we talk about about the the importance of the employee voice, and we talk about also the importance of of management guidance. I mean, where does where does the buck actually stop? What is the senior exec accountability and transformation? How much of that is actually driven top down? How much is it, is, is driven bottom up? Um, and where does the buck stop? Because it seems like you can find people who will derail a cultural initiative at any level of the organization. Um, not so easy to find people who will take accountability. How do you manage that that kind of a question? Yeah, from a couple different places, and it's such a good question to to be asking. Honestly, throughout the whole transformation, like we really believe that it is leadership's responsibility and accountability to set that vision um, that we spoke about uh, in the presentation of giving the market context, giving the competitive context, giving the business context 
for why a transformation is necessary. We all know that sort of inherently, we need to understand why we need to change um, sort of first and foremost before we have any ab you know, ability to actually move toward that change. And so what we coach the leaders that we're working with is not to make any assumptions about how even their own leadership team may be vis-a-vis -vis that vision. So we've uh, used an example of a client that we worked with where it was a new CEO and she had set this new vision and new strategic direction. She knew that the market was about to just, you know, knock them off their game. And she started moving forward and wondered why nothing was changing. And when we got in there, we started seeing that that leadership team wasn't actually aligned, you know, and, and we all see it in terms of sometimes people sit back and go, oh, another leadership change. Let's I'll wait a few months to see if it really sticks to see if I should actually do anything about it. And so getting that leadership involvement and really setting that top down vision. But to what Jerry was saying, there also needs to be that voice of the employee, the voice of the manager that connects both the top down and the bottom up so that it gets translated into real behaviors and, and, and tweaks to that vision based on what is the reality um, of the day to day. And in terms of the like change planning and the communications planning that we do, we don't let those leaders sort of go back into uh, you know other responsibilities or, or other initiatives. We have them stay sort of front and center, um, representing that vision, representing the change so that it's reinforcing to the organization that this is really a necessary thing to do and that we are doing it and we are moving forward and celebrating the successes um, as they come. And um, just before we close out, just on that note, um, Al said it earlier, you know, um, are you asking for uh, results? Are you, are you, but, or are you asking for the tests? Are you, uh, are, as leaders, um, the, the clearest way to start demonstrating accountability for these shifts you're, you're asking for in results is to shift to asking for all the work that it takes to get there. And that's where that accountability starts to change. Because if I think that I'm going to, that my performance is going to be judged based on the way I'm really employing curious behaviors and insight driven behaviors, that's where things start to really meaningfully shift. Al, any final thoughts before we close down? I think the one thing I didn't say, and I won't belabor this point, but courage is the most important factor on each one of these, trusting and learning, uh, the culture of data, uh, making the decision to lean into pain points as opposed to what the customers see immediately. It's courage. It comes down to leadership that can decide and leadership that's offered autonomous, you know, kind of power to their teams to just solve the problems that they needed to, to, to solve. I think that's the one thing we see missing, but I can't put that on a slide, So, but I can say it out loud. So that's something I'd love to see a lot more of um, moving forward. That, that's super well put. I mean, I've, I've been working on digital transformations for years, and this is, um, and I've learned stuff that I'll be using tomorrow. So this has been a fantastic session, um, super rich in, in content. Uh, everybody, yes, the recording will be available. You'll get a copy of it. You've got... Um, the EXP magazine, which is available now for download, um, grab that QR code right now. And here are the contact details of our panelists. And do not hesitate um, to reach out because if you need help, you now know where you can find it. Kelly, Jerry, Al, thank you so much uh, for today. And uh, we hope to see you back on Ogilvy on sometime real soon. Thank you.